She is also the youngest woman ever to serve in elected congressional leadership. Congresswoman Stefanik, welcome to Meet the Press. Great to be with you, Kristen. Thank you so much for being here. I want to start by talking about 2024, some of what we've heard over the past 48 hours. Obviously, President Biden officially kicking off his campaign against former President Trump, who's the strong front runner. You are one of Trump's strongest supporters. In his speech, President Biden cast the former president as a threat to democracy. This was an argument that was effective in 2020. It was a winning argument for Democrats in 2022. How do you answer that charge? Well, first, Kristen, I wouldn't say it's a winning argument. In fact, in 2022, Democrats lost the House and House Republicans ran on the issues that matter to the American people. We ran on securing the border. We ran on addressing the historic inflation, which the Mm -hmm. American people know is a result of Joe Biden's failed policies and the trillions of dollars of reckless spending. And what Joe Biden didn't mention in his speech were any of the policies that have created a crisis across America. So zero mention of the border, which is wide open and a top issue, even in my home state in New York. You have Democrat mayors who are speaking out about Joe Biden's border crisis. No mention of inflation, which continues to be a concern for voters across my district. And when it comes to threats to uh, to democracy, Joe Biden and Democrats are a threat to democracy. We see them attempting to remove President Trump from the ballot. We saw this in Colorado and Maine. That is the suppression of the American people and the American people's ability to cast their ballots this November. So it's Democrats that are a threat to democracy. We should note, of course, there's no evidence that President Biden is in any way coordinating with the Justice Department in terms of the indictments. That's something that they keep doing. It's so annoying that with Trump, this last, I would say, six to eight months, they've been doing that. We should know, blah, 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 blah. Every time he says this, they'll play a clip and then they'll come back. We should know, like they're having to put a footnote and it's like why aren't you putting a footnote at every lie that's told about from everyone it's just trump they're adding this footnote in it's against former president trump but staying on this issue of january 6th because of course mr trump was talking about this as well this weekend we did mark the three-year anniversary and i want to pause for a minute and play some of the comments that you made on the evening of now This is where she believes this. um, And when I say she, um, I mean the host. This is where she believes. uh, Oh, uh, this is I'm not going to say she the establishment believes that they have a lot of Republicans on video, like a gotcha moment. And I've never seen somebody reply to a supposed gotcha moment in this way. Um, I think it was a good reply uh, from her point of view. But let's listen of that day. Let's take a look. This has been a truly tragic day for America. Americans will always have the freedom of speech and the constitutional right to protest, but violence in any form is absolutely unacceptable. It is anti-American and must be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. In terms of what we're hearing today, former President Trump has referred to January 6th as a quote, beautiful day. Just this weekend, he referred to some of those who are serving time for having stormed the Capitol as, quote, hostages. Do you still feel as though that day was tragic and that those who were responsible should be held responsible to the fullest extent of the law? Well, first of all, Kristen, as typical for NBC and the biased media, you played one excerpt of my speech. I stand by my comments that I made on the House floor. I stood up for election integrity and I challenged and objected to the certification of the state of Pennsylvania because of the unconstitutional overreach. So I absolutely stand by my floor speech. I am proud to support President Trump. And I want to correct another statement you made that there is no coordination with Joe Biden and the Department of Justice in prosecutions against President Trump. We just saw Hunter Biden defy a congressional subpoena and the White House admitting it was in coordination with Joe Biden the morning of. That is coordination. And I believe that Joe Biden will be found to be the most corrupt president in our nation's history. And that's why all of the investigative work that we're doing is so, so important because the American people, they deserve transparency and accountability. A lot to unpack there. Of course, the White House has said that Hunter Biden is acting unilaterally On the issue of election integrity, though, as you know, Trump took his case to court more than 60 times that there was fraud. He didn't win. But I want to get back to this key question. Nick, when did news anchors 
who are supposed to be interviewing people, when did they just started getting in debates? Why is she like retorting arguments as if she's the advocate for that side? You're supposed to come on, ask the questions, let the guests answer the questions. Then you go to the other guests because she they, she has another guest. She she brought on a conservative, then she brings on a liberal. And that's what you do. That But in this case, it's very odd the way... Uh, like I said, in the last six to 10 months, they've been doing this with, with the questioning with people with, that, that are supporters of, of Trump. Do you still think it was a tragic day? Do you think that the people who stormed the Capitol should be held responsible to the full extent of the I law? have concerns about the treatment of January 6 hostages. Uh, I have concerns. We have a role in Congress of oversight over our treatments of prisoners. Uh, and I believe that we're seeing the weaponization of the federal government against not just President Trump, but we're seeing it against conservatives. We're seeing it against Catholics. Oh, really? Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I'm so proud to serve on this. Oh, really? Oh, really? Do you guys know that 60%, over 60% of the civil asset forfeiture cases are black people? That's how they steal our wealth? But now they're Malcolm X, CJ. <laughs> now they're talking about a group being targeted by the federal government. Excuse me, ma'am. But I'll let it continue. That's yeah, but it's, it's uh, very close to ending here on the select committee on the weaponization of the government because the American people want answers. They want transparency. And they understand that as you look across this country, there seems to be two sets of rules. If your last name is Clinton or it's Biden, you get to live by a different set of rules than if you're an everyday patriotic American. I've been clear, Kristen, if you go back and play the full speech I gave on the House floor, I condemn the violence just like I condemn the violence of the BLM riots. But I also importantly stood for election integrity and security of our elections, which if we don't have that we do not have a democracy so the real threat to our democracy is these baseless witch hunt investigations and lawsuits against president trump whether it's tish james or whether we see in the dc circuit court and that is undemocratic and it's shredding our constitution and you know who agrees with me Kristen? the american people that's why president trump is winning in poll after poll against joe biden the justice department has indicted so uh, this is where I'm gonna I'm gonna end it and and uh, kind of there's a, a lot of things she said there. What I don't like, Tucker Carlson did this too. How with these things they keep inserting BLM in in their sort of uh, assessment of why it wasn't why yeah. why it was too much force or not enough force is somehow BLM like equating what BLM did like. It's the same sort of same sort they, of they thing. They are literally saying out loud. Going... Go ahead. They are literally saying the quiet part. Like I seen what you said with Tuck, I saw Tucker say it too. This their argument essentially is, "Hey guys, god damn it, you're only supposed to use the cops to beat black people and their supporters. What the hell?" Cause they keep saying like, "What? What about the George Floyd protests? What about this?" They're not saying that the the, the George Floyd protesters shouldn't have been beat. She even said that she was against the. "Quote unquote rise at the police start, but she, what their argument is, what the MAGA right argument is essentially is that there's a there's a certain class who should not be uh, attacked by the police. We should be allowed to protest while there's a certain class of people, anyone who support holding the police state accountable, they should be having the they should have the police state sent on them. So that's why I wish one person, just one, who has access to Carlson, will call him out for this hypocrisy, because I we have been consistent, or being like we're consistent on all this on every single one of these issues." We mocked January 6th. We called out the power grab of January 6th. We called out how they used January 6th to weaponize the police state. But we also called out how the state government cracked down on us, on uh, on the Ferguson rioters, the people who tear gas people and cause people to have miscarriages at the, at the Black Lives Matter protest. The same way I called out uh, authoritarianism at the trucker protest in Canada. I said, that's strong as well. So y'all know how RBN is consistent, but the right wing populists only stand against authoritarianism yeah. when it affects white people. That's why I say Tucker Carlson and his people are they their primary politics is white identity politics. So whenever I see the minority criticism, whenever I see every once in a while, I'm like, oh my god, why RBN always talk about race? Uh, you, you see this as well, CJ. Every, every once in a while, yeah. why does JB talk about race? Why do Savvy talk about race? Why do RBN talk about race? Your boy talk about race more than we do. The people you like talk about race more than we do.
They view everything in politics through the lens of white identity politics, and that's the entirety of the right wing. What we talk about is the material conditions of our people and how to improve it. We, we talk about how to uplift everyone, how to end state violence for everyone, for everyone. They talk about interstate violence only for them. CJ, and this is that? why this is about. yeah, and this is why I call there is also just like there's a black misleadership class, there's a white misleadership class because the white worker is going through a lot of the same things that the black and brown, indigenous, and workers of all shades is going through. But then when you have um, misleadership like a Tucker Carlson who kind of gives you the right critique but doesn't fully give you the right critique because he still wants to dabble in the culture war. He still wants to kind of keep the white worker separated from all other workers. Like, I can't I can't get with that. So understand, um, when, when we're talking about a revolution, when we're talking about a movement, when we're talking about a coalition of people fighting for class, or fighting for the same class, a class struggle, that's not going to include people like Jackson Hinkle and Tucker Carlson. So, so, sorry, it's not. It's, it's not going to include them. So believing Maybe. that they are somehow the these messiahs, the leaders uh, that's going to be the, the leaders of some sort of movement, it is so okay. absurd. It's so absurd. Sure. There are people that really think that they're going to have this white boy revolution. <laughs> they're going to have a revolution in the most powerful empire we've ever seen with a bunch of bourgeoisie white boys. And then, like, oh, no, we don't care. We can, we can, uh, it don't matter if we piss off the black radicals. We can tell them to fuck off with their issues. Let's get this done with the white suburbs. That's what the... That's what the uh, <laughs> that's what the modern right wing populist movement is all about. Fuck reparations. Fuck indigenous people. Fuck all your guys' radical ass. Let's get the suburban white people together and we have a revolution. Good luck with that. You guys and see what these people like, go into lives real quick. Go ahead, CJ. It feels like these are the people. When we're talking about a coalition, these are the people that we have to close our mouth about about race. These are the people yeah. we have to close our mouth about transgenderism, like. When when did the Black Panther and the Young Patriots, when that coalition happened, the Rainbow Coalition that everybody harkens back to to say, why don't we do this? When did the Black Panther, people, Black Panther stop talking about shit, Nick? Do you recall that shit? I don't recall it. They never did that. And then people say with a serious <laughs> face, they say, you guys can't talk about radical politics. You guys can't talk about race. Because what if you turn off the white person you need, the white suburban who will be turned off by that? I'm like, fam, we don't need Joe, who's 54 years old, who got arthritis, who is triggered by the word reparation. They are counter-revolutionary. We do not, if any movement that is catering to people who get upset when you tell the truth about the establishment is a weak link and need to be cut out very early. This is what Kwame Torre said. There's a lot of people that need re-theory, need re-class analysis. You guys talking about having class struggle and revolution, but you're scared to call yourself socialist. They, they talk about collective bargaining, but they're not socialists. What the fuck you think that came from? Where you guys think class struggle come from? But they're afraid to call themselves socialists, but, they, but they're supposed to be the people that we rely on to get the revolution started? Absolutely not. How the fuck is the Fox News watching Trump supporter with arthritis will never get off the goddamn couch in his life? Why the fuck would, should, we, would, should we try to appeal to them? <laughs> I have friends that say stupid shit like this. Well, you guys got to appeal to the white suburb. No, the fuck we don't. We need to get 15% of the radical working class that we need. We know that 60% of the workers make $30,000 or less. Why the hell are we appealing to white suburbanites? That's my question. We need to appeal to the workers who are not uh, tricked by the uh, two-party duopoly. There, there's a myth that Russell Brand keeps fucking spreading. I, I had to stop watching this guy. He's a fucking, he's like, man, the Trump, Trump, they getting the Trump coalition of the working class. Bro, the Trump is the book wide Z. Look at the average salary yeah. of these people. People yeah. pretending that the Trump movement is a working class movement. These people won't stand up to the police state, fam. They criticize you for standing up to the police state, but they talking about they're going to have a white boy Trump revolution. And and, and I'm seeing this so much that I'm, I'm starting to speak out against it aggressively 
Because I see, just like the Bernie Sanders left, there are a lot of people leading people off a of, off of cliff. How many followers do Russell Brand have? Six to, six to seven million. I've been watching him recently. He keeps doing his thing where he's trying to pretend that like the Trump movement is like the vanguard of the workers. I'm like, oh, what? Jesus Christ. All the good coverage <laughs> means nothing anymore. He would do a good coverage on Ukraine, mean nothing with you saying. And, and I'm not strong, man. I don't, I never had time to do a segment on him. It not it never been worth it. Like Russell Brand not worth yeah. it. Like he not got someone that like worth my time to a segment attacking. He's not that harmful. I'm just telling you guys some right. things that annoy me. I've been watching a lot of segments. We keep doing this. He propping up Alec Jones as a truth teller, even though he's a fucking fed. Like he just had Alec Jones on the show. Like, oh my god, this is all the things you got right. Yeah, you got some things wrong. Hey, what do you mean you, he got some things wrong? Those things he got th- wrong is very fucking important because the things that Alec Jones get wrong delegitimize the true shit that we are talking about. And they say this all the time. All these people that want to get, who want to grift off of Alex Jones, they be like, yeah, we know you got some things wrong before. The fuck? We need clarity. <laughs> we can't have people confusing people. <laughs> like, it's absurd what I've been seeing recently. But CJ, I'll pass to you. And, and it's, it's, it's like, it's a, lot of, it's a lot of overlapping with a lot of the things that we're talking about from the people who are saying they're covid uh sort of oppressed to the sort of populist right to the sort of tucker carlson sort of it's a lot of overlapping i'm not saying they're all the same but it's a lot of um overlapping and it's it's, a lot of the overlapping is with this idea that the because like the this is what it is nick the white part of the white bourgeoisie feels oppressed about COVID. So now they feel like an oppressed class that can, I guess, you know, (laughs) lead the group. Like I have now been oppressed. So now I'm a marginalized group that now should be leading a movement, which is just, you know, preposterous. And and, and this is the last thing uh, I'll say on this. And that is, we have to stop believing that rich white people speak for poor white people. We have to stop thinking yes. that just yes. because Tucker says this, that oh, white workers. No, no, no. Nick, you probably know a bunch of white workers in your neck of the woods. They're not listening to Tucker. They're not listening to Tucker. And if you talking and if you separately, this is what makes me upset. You're not even talking to your white worker about black shit. You just talking to people. I'm not supposed to be able to talk about other shit that doesn't involve this united sort of coalition. I'm just supposed to stop talking about it. So are you going to stop talking about COVID? Like, are you going to stop talking about, are we going to stop talking about the police brutality? Are we, you know what I mean? Because that's going to offend somebody. We can't talk about Palestine. You know why? There's some people who's for Israel in this coalition. You get what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Go ahead. Yep. The That's same my thing word. that Bernie, the same thing that Bernie and AOC supporters say. The, the remember, I told you, I view the Trump support same as Bernie people. Bernie people say there's certain things we can't talk about because you don't want to make liberals up uncomfortable, right? Now we got people saying that there are things that black radical can't talk about because we not we don't want to upset the conservative suburban white worker. So for our, all the people, including my friends, that are pushing this talking point. I want to ask, I, want, I need you to ask yourself this question. What's the difference between you and, and the average Bernie supporter? 